All right, Oliver, the participants are joining the webinar. We're at 26. Now let's wait a couple of seconds more, maybe like half a minute, a minute, until we're sure, you know, um, sure. the participants were able to join the webinar and then we're gonna kick it off. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, and as I mentioned, I can see you. I don't know if you heard it or you were gone. So that's really good uh, in one screen. So perfect. Perfect, and yeah. I mean, for those who already joined the webinar, um, if you have any questions, you can use the Q and A um, section in the in the Zoom and ask your questions there. Um, we're gonna try to, you know, answer all the questions that you have, not only at the end, but you know, um, during the the webinar, if if possible, of course. We're at sixty three participants right now. Let's wait. It's still number is still increasing so let's wait another couple of seconds and then i suggest we're gonna launch so bulk already has a question before we started how does it differ from canton to canton especially for canton the vote we don't need to answer it right now Oliver. i i suggest you know that we 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 first kick it off and then get back to Bolko's question. We're at 72. It's now 12. Go to's number is still increasing, but I suggest you know that we we kick it off. Okay, Oliver. I'm ready. All right. So hello everyone. Welcome to SickTech. I'm very excited that you joined our webinar today with Oliver Reuter on tax aspects for angel investors. Oliver is um, the owner of Troyfin Reuter AG, a tax and accounting firm. And he has been also advising investors on um, how to make their investments privately and through a holding. So yeah, he's, I think, you know, he's, he's a very competent um, speaker that we have today. So I'm super excited. I myself will be moderating the two days webinar. I'm a board member at SIGTIC and co-lead at the SIGTIC Academy. And in my professional life, I'm a founder and managing director at Embarklo, a law firm specializing in advice in high growth startups. For those of you who don't know what SIGTIC is and the SIGTIC Academy, here's what you need to know. SIGTIC has become the largest angel investor community in Switzerland with more than 500 members consisting of amazing individual investors and the most prominent VCs in the industry. Our mission is to match start and smart money investors with the best early stage tech startups. And SIGTIC holds several, holds several startup pitching events a year on site or online. So if you're looking for investment or networking opportunities, then look no further. You can check out the events on SIGTIC.ch slash events. On top of that, SIGTIC has launched the SIGTIC Academy two years ago, providing founders and investors with world-class education material to boost the Swiss startup ecosystem. SIGTIC has also published the Investor Handbook, a game changer, containing everything you need to know for becoming an angel investor. You can order our handbook for free on our website. Please also check out our previous SIGTIC Academy videos and webinars on YouTube or our website. And last but not least, if you have not signed up to SIGTIC as an investor, please reach out to us. We would be thrilled to welcome you. And a big thank you to our sponsor, Ernst Gönner Stiftung, who has been supporting the SIGTIC Academy for, from day one. And now, without further ado, let's jump into our webinar. Um, Oliver, the stage is yours. Well, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Michel. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, when I heard like two uh, days ago how many registrations you already have, I was sort of overwhelmed uh, about the huge interest uh, about tax aspects for angel investors. And, you know, so thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm going to try my best to live up to the expectations of all participants and, you know, try to, uh, to, to render some, some bullet points, so to speak, to be considered if you are in fact an angel investor and you would like to optimize your taxation. So yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, introduction, table of contents, 
Um, first, I would like to speak about, you know, the kind of taxes, qualified investments, I would like to, to plant the term. Uh, and then there are basically three different kind of levels in terms of taxation for angel investors. Like if you make investments as a private or within the private ownership, what happens if you would be deemed as a professional investor? Then the next step would be to set up your own holding company, which would make the investments. And then at the end, obviously, a summary recommendations. Uh, as Michelle already said, please feel free to ask any questions anytime, not just at the end. Uh, yeah, Michelle will uh, gather them and pass them on to me. So yeah, kind of taxes. Um, what kind of taxes <clears throat> need to be considered as an angel investor? Asset taxes, of course, that would be the first one. Asset taxes are can be sometimes even be deemed as a double taxation because any asset of any Swiss franc you have was earned in one way or another beforehand. And as such, it has already been taxed whilst or during the income process. Nevertheless, Switzerland has asset taxes, uh, other jurisdictions do not. However, the asset taxes are fairly low especially considered to income taxes. And this is why we are not going to speak about the asset taxation very much going forward. It's still there. It is a subject. But I think in terms of startup investments, uh, angel investors, a low key tax issue. Then interest income. It's very, very rarely that startup companies pay out interests. Maybe if you have a convertible loan agreement, but even then, usually there are no interests, or if there are interests, very low. So again, for the sake of you know being uh, um, um, compulsory or have everything covered, it is listed here. But we're not going to talk about that any further in detail as we go along. Dividends, uh, dividend taxes. Again, for startup companies, certainly not the most important way to, 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 to profit from your investments. But for the sake, again, of being all inclusive, we need to talk about dividends uh, or income from dividends because there are indeed certain measures that you can take in order to, to optimize your dividend taxation. And now the fourth and certainly the most important tax issue, the capital gains. I mean, if you invest in a startup company at the end of the day, that's what you want to achieve, capital gains. And this is mainly what we're going to be talking about throughout this webinar. Um, yeah, so those are the kind of taxes. And then we, before we jump into the, the details, I would like to uh, plant a term. The term is qualified investment. And from a tax point of view, a qualified investment is an investment of at least 10% or more percentage or stake in the startup company. At the moment, and deliver. Does that apply, you know, to private investors, and as well as, you know, if you hold the shares in a holding company? Yes, it applies just the same for this presentation. All participants may want to keep this in mind. Qualified investment, ten percent or more. In any case, yes. What the consequences are of a, of, a, of a qualified investment, I will get to that as we go along through the different levels and options, but yes. Okay. And back to Bolko's question, you know, is there a difference, you know, from canton to canton, you know, with respect to that qualified investment qualification? Well, we have those 24 or 26 cantons. Um, the tax rules are in every canton are harmonized. So there is a harmonization rule in place and all cantons have to adhere to that. Nevertheless, there can always be different views about, you know, certain income streams are to be taxed. Sometimes the cantons even contradict themselves. So that can happen. However, in terms of the qualified investment, that's the same for all cantons. That is harmonized. Um, so there's no difference. Where we 
have a difference, of course, is the tax rate. You know, the tax rate of qualified investments, that's different, not just between the communities, uh, between the cantons, but also communities. Okay. So uh, private ownership, you know, if someone wants to build up his own startup uh, portfolio, usually you do it as a private uh, investor. You do not even have a holding company, so you don't really have another choice. Uh, I mean, of course, you can set up the holding before you make the first investment, but you know, 80, 90% of the cases that we see, you start, uh, you know, as an individual. So you as the individual, you are the stakeholder. Uh, the regular taxation, we will see a numbered example uh, after on the next slide, uh, but the regular taxation is the income from dividend is fully taxed just the same as the other income. So if you have income from work, like salary income, maybe you have rental income, and then you also have dividend income, this is all going to be added up, everything together, and taxed at the same rate as everything else. And now the very good news, and this is the news that many other jurisdictions are very jealous about the Swiss situation, capital gains are tax-free. No taxes on capital gains, but again, only if you hold the investment privately. So I think that is the very good news and, and an important thing that we will follow up later. And Oliver, can you elaborate what exactly you know, it means to hold the shares privately? I mean, now apart from being qualified as a professional trader, what, what are the pitfalls and what needs to be considered in order to you know, hold the shares privately? Well, the pitfall or the downside, they are very minimal. I mean, the worst that can happen is that your investment is worthless. You have to write it off. You know, that's that. So the funds are gone. Um, but there's no way to, to, uh, to have additional um, um, responsibilities. So no one can force you that you have to pay in, like it's never able, mandatory, you have to pay in more funds. Of course you can, or contractually you may be willing to do so, but you, you do not have that obligation as a standard rule. Also, you do not have any other responsibilities. Uh, so from that point, um, that's fairly easy. Of course, you have to put about those investments on your personal tax return. You have to declare it on your personal tax return. Um, that's that. Um, maybe one pitfall is, sorry, yeah, if your investment turns out to be worthless, you can write it off, yes, but there are no additional taxes incentives. Because if you have the investment in a holding company and it is worthless, you can write it off. And this write-off, you know, lowers your taxes. Uh, if you have it uh, in a personal um, 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 holdership, you cannot uh, achieve any tax incentives if you write it off. Um, this does this answer the question? Hopefully, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And so, like, let, let's let's look at a situation where basically, you know, an angel investor also, you know, provides some certain, you know, advisor services and receives, you know, those shares. You know, in return for his services, does that you know person still holds the shares you know privately in that in that case, or is that already you know something that would qualify the shares you know at, as not being owned privately? Depends on the specific case. I think, Michelle, if that's okay with you, I would like to follow up on that question when we get to the professional investor subject. If that's okay with you, I would like to hold off for the time being a very good question, but we'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and, and if I forget, just remind me, please. But, but it, it, yeah, good question. We will follow up on that. Okay. So yeah, regular taxation. Uh, and then if you have a reduced taxation, uh, you know, private ownership, uh, that only applies if you have the qualified investment and what does reduced ta taxation means? It means that the dividend income from dividends, the taxation is reduced 60% of the regular rate. Uh, it's an average because on the federal level, it is 60% 
for every resident in Switzerland. So for example, you receive a dividend of 10,000, then you only have to put 6,000 on your personal tax return. And the 6,000 is going to be taxed together with all other income uh, flows, but the re remaining 4,000 adds free of taxes. Most of the cantons follow the same rule, like the 60-40, but there are cantons which give a 50% reduction rate or a 30% reduction rate. You have to follow up uh, depending on the canton you live. And this is why it says average, but yeah, as an average 60% reduction uh, or a 40% reduction, sorry, 60% taxation. But again, the good news is the capital gains, no taxes, tax-free. Again, the good news also with a qualified investment. Uh, yeah, as promised, here is the numbered example. Uh, you know, uh, marriage, two kids, residence, Zurich City, taxable income, everything together with, you know, salary income and whatever is 150,000. Uh, you know, for the sake of calculating the correct numbers, uh, no religion, I assume no religion, and uh, I use tax rates of the current year, year uh, 2022. Um, now, the example, and I think this is also maybe the participants may want to keep this example in mind because we're always going to follow up on that. Let's say you have an in initial investment of 100,000, then for the first four years, you have a dividend payment of 20,000 each year. Again, it may not be very common for a startup company to pay the dividends, but again, to be all inclusive, uh, I have listed those dividend payments. And then at the end of year five, you know, that's a best case scenario. That's what we're all hoping for uh, when we invest in startups. In this example, let's say we can sell the shares for 1 million. So in total, we have net proceeds or net income of 980,000. So you have the four dividends, 80,000. And then at the end, you have 900,000 capital gain. So if you take the aggregate of all that, that's 980,000 in total, so to speak. How do the numbers look like? Uh, I'm not going to follow up with an exact calculation, but here you can see uh, the results. If you have, you know, the regular taxation, if, if it's not a qualified uh, um, um, investment, you're going to pay 13,000, a bit more than 13,000 Swiss, uh, um, uh, Swiss francs on taxes for all five years. So I said 980,000 proceeds incoming total, but only 13,600 taxes to be paid. Why is that number so little? Again, the 900,000 capital gain is free of any taxes. So the 13,636 only refers to the four dividend payments. That's it. And if your, uh, your, your investment is a qualified investment, it's even less, 7,411. Now, when you hear those numbers, I mean, can it really get any better? I mean, I'm making an investment here, 980,000 in total. I'm going to pay either 13,000 or 7,500 taxes. I don't think we really need to talk about that any further. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, and then we could close the webinar, so to speak. But that, no, of course, it's not as easy. There are pitfalls. And now I would like to lead over to the question you had a few minutes ago, Michelle. What are the pitfalls? The tax authorities have the legal grounds or the legal means to reclassify someone as a private investor. That's what we have been talking before, as a private investor, into a so-called professional investor. And the key argument to be potentially become a professional investor is the tax authorities are going to look, are you investing, you know, with a long term approach in order to just, you know, uh, you know, yeah, long term approach for, you know, age or retirement or whatever. Uh, is that your approach? 
or is your approach a very active approach similar to uh, to uh, an entrepreneur or a professional yeah professional entrepreneur um, so that is the key criteria private or professional investor uh, there is a, a Kreisschreiben if you enter in Google Kreisschreiben 26 that's an eight page long document and in that eight page document it clearly defines in more detail uh, what it means or what criteria the tax authorities are going to look at if or should you maybe become deemed a professional investor uh, Tax authorities are going to look at the duration of, of holding the assets, the transaction volume, uh, you know, the turnover. Uh, they will look at the fact, are you going to use those the income from the investments for your standard regular living? Or do you have another job where you have salary income and you live from that salary? Um, if you borrow capital from banks or friends or from, from, from professional uh, loan companies uh, so you can leverage your investments, then you are very soon deemed as a professional investor. If you hedge your investments with derivatives, well, in terms of startups, probably not really possible, but still, that's what it says in the Kreisschreiben. If you have special knowledge, I mean, if you are a startup uh, consultant or if you are a financial advisor, that's what they look at. And of course, if you already have a pre-existing self-employed status, uh, so if you're already in that field doing business and then, you know, you, you add another uh, investment, you could be deemed as a professional investor. And this again leads into the question you had, Michelle. Let's look at that a little bit more in detail because I think that is a very important issue I can already let everybody know you definitely do not want to be deemed as a professional trader. That would be the worst case scenario, so to speak. So I would like to look into that a little bit closer. First example, we have an IT employee in a higher position. He makes a very good salary. And then he feels like, you know, I don't want to give my funds to the bank or, or, or you know, whatever. So uh, and I already have a lot of real estate investments and so on and so forth. But I want to start up building my own um, um, startup investment portfolio. So we uh, invest in five startups. Uh, some of them are within the IT sector. And for those, he also provides some consulting fees and, 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 and provides his network and so and so on. The other three investments he managed passively. So he gives the money, he lets it sit. Once a year, he looks at the numbers, a yearly AGM, but that's it. Use common sense, it says at the beginning. Do you think that this IT employee would be deemed as a professional trader? I can give you the answer right away, no. In this case, I don't see an issue at all the way it is described. The second end example, a person does not have a full-time third-party job. He manages his overall assets, actively consulting those uh, startup companies. He has 10 to 15, it changes a little bit in total. He starts, he speaks at startup conferences, had other mandates in this area, board memberships. And um, he also uses the income from those startup investments to financially support his family. Again, I think here the answer is fairly clear. I have described it in a way that it's you know, very clear that this person would be certainly deemed as a professional investor. Between those two very clear descriptions or very clear example, there is a gray area, you know, and, and, and this is a bit the bad news, you know, if you are a professional trader or not, it can be sometimes be a very fine line, needs to be looked at uh, in more detail. Um, yeah, sometimes it's clear, but more often it's not. Um, but nevertheless, let's say, you know, um, we have a professional trader, what are the consequences? That would mean that in this case, the capital gains, like the 900,000 in our example, they are to be taxed because the tax authorities deem those investments as business related assets. It's like a sole proprietorship. Uh, so those investments, they are business assets and therefore to be taxed. 
But not only that, on the 900,000 capital in Greece, you then also have to pay first pillar, all of our uh, contributions, and everything together could lead up to 40% additional levies on the capital gains. So if we look at that in numbers, uh, the private ownership, the 13,000, uh, regular and reduced, 7,500, these are the numbers that we already looked at. And now the professional investor, 475,000. So it's a, a scary number, so to speak, if you compare it to purely private ownership. The reason for that being so high is that in the year five, where you achieve the 900,000 income, you're going to get into the highest tax rate. We have professional tax rates in Switzerland for individuals. So you get into the highest tax rate. I do not know by heart in the city of Zurich, but probably that's around 30, 32, 35%. And uh, then you have the first pillar contributions, 12.5%. And in this example, I already deducted costs. Because the investment is deemed as a business asset, of course, you can also deduct costs associated. 100,000 is probably a fairly high number. Probably you're not going to have as many costs to manage your startup investments. But even deducted the 100,000, you're still going to end up with, uh, with such a high tax bill, worst case. Um, yeah, so and as I mentioned before, you never ever wanna go into that situation. Uh, so the question remains, how can I remedy this? What would be the solution not becoming a professional investor? Oliver, Oliver yep. we have many questions from yep. the audience. Go ahead. So like, one major question, you know, a lot of, lot of, lot of the participants have is, you know, what if I, you know, advise startups, you know, and get remunerate and get remunerated, you know, for that. So I get fees, you know, for advising startups, but at the same time, you know, I hold shares, you know, privately, and you know, does it make a difference, you know, if I basically, you know, provide services to the startups, not, you know, privately, but through a company, let's say. Yeah, so, I mean, again, I fully understand the question, and that's one of the key question and aspects. Maybe I've been a bit short about that, but, but, but I can elaborate a bit more in detail. Each and every single situation has been looked at differently and in detail and separately. And even then, we quite often still experience this gray area situation. And all you can really do in those cases is, you know, put together your situation on a piece of paper, send it in proactively to the tax authorities, let them have a look at it, and, you know, potentially or hopefully confirm in writing that it's professional trader or not. Because the worst case is that you go along as it is, and then you get a letter from the tax authorities saying, by the way, we deem you as a professional investor, and then if the past one or two years have not been fully assessed yet, you may even have to pay taxes backwards. Uh, so really uh, um, uh, a problem, so to speak. But now to your question, if you render um, um, services, consulting services for the same startup or even for another startup potentially, we always advise that you would get a fee for that. Um, because what happens is if you, if you have an investment and you provide consulting services and you get a fee for that or a salary, you can claim towards the tax authorities, yeah, okay, I'm doing, you know, consulting, but I get a fee for that. So I'm employed sort of. And then you have a much better situation to tell the tax authorities the investments, they are held separately. That's a purely long-term private issue. And for the professional part, for the consulting, I get a fee, so it's separate. Um, so that would be my response to that question, if that is what you know the person was looking for. Um, so yeah, there's, of course, there is a, a more heightened risk if you provide consulting services. Yes, there is. 
but I cannot tell, and I always uh, um, recommend to get a fee for that. Um, because if you do not get a fee for that, that in the contrast means that you are contributing to the increase of the share capital by giving free consulting advices. So there again is the business-wise approach is already in the price increase of the shares. So this is why it's always better to get a fee. You can argue better towards the tax authorities. Hopefully that's the right yeah. answer. I mean, I think there is like a huge gray area, right? Because like like every like angel investor, you know, in, in some sense, you know, supports the startups um, for free, you know, with some with some advice and then um, yeah i think you know i mean there it's impossible to get a fee right for you know for being the smart money and getting some advice i think you know it's what you mean is like you know if you basically you know pass a certain uh, threshold then it's definitely better to get you know a fee for that and be employed by the company not being self-employed i think that's what you mentioned and if you're basically you know moving into the direction of you know, being more like self-employed, then it would definitely be better to, you know, provide the services through one of your companies, right? The consulting company. Much better explanation than my per my explanation. Yeah, very exactly. That's what it is. I mean, those two examples I have put up on the slide again, again, those are clear examples. Um, but yeah, there's a huge gray area and we have those discussions many, many times. I may advise you to, you know, Google Kreisschreiben 2026, is it? Yeah, Kreisschreiben 26, it's an eight page. Uh, read through it, maybe study with it. And if you're still uncertain, you know, look for a tax advisor specialist and get it sorted. That's the best advice I can give right here at this webinar. But it is sometimes a quite a big problem, yeah. All right, I will, you know, um, you can proceed, Oliver. I think, you know, we have more questions regarding that topic. We'll get back to that, you know, um, in case we have time, you know, once you have um, finished your presentation, okay? Perfect. Interrupt me anytime, but I will continue. So how can we remedy the situation? How can we heal this situation of not becoming a professional trader? And that would be, uh, no, that's the numbers. There you go. And that would be to set up your own company, your own holding company. So yeah, you would set up a company, you would be the sole, the one and only shareholder, a company would be completely um, owned uh, by you. So yeah, set up an own company. Uh, for that, you need an address, you need to have a director, you need to have the seed capital, uh, for a Aktiengesellschaft, for a, a share limited company, it is 100,000 um, share capital or seed capital. Um, only 50,000 has to be paid in, but the overall liability amount, so to speak, is 100,000. If you would like to go for a GmbH, uh, then it's a 20,000. Um, but you need to have that liquidity up front in order to set up the company. The costs... Um, you know, I mean, if you look at all the other bullet points, it seems like a rather a lot of tasks and responsibilities you have once you decide to set up your own company. Yes, I mean, there are certain additional tasks and responsibilities, but I think it looks worse than it may seem. Um, and especially for all those services which are listed here, there are accountants, treuhenders, uh, tax advisors out there. Uh, so they can provide all those services for you. Of course, it's going to cost, that's, you know, how it is, I guess, initially 5,000 to set up the structure and then the yearly, you know, uh, ongoing costs 5,000. That can be more, it can be much more, you know, depending on your specific case, uh, uh, you know, um, but yeah, just as a, as a rough um, um, estimation. Then, of course, you have to, to make uh, accounting, bookkeeping, uh, um, you know, you need to, to um, sort all the documents, uh, receipts, bank account statements, contracts. Uh, every year you have to prepare an AGM, uh, you have to submit a tax return. 
uh, because in this case, your, your investments are not going to be declared on your personal tax return, but those investments go on to the tax return of the holding itself. I mean, the holding is a separate legal entity and the holding by itself has to submit a tax return. And capital gain taxes are taxable, uh, just the same as it would be as a professional uh, investor. Uh, we're gonna look at that in more detail what it means, but just for the time being, capital gains are taxable, except you have a qualifying investment. Um, if you intend to set up a holding, it is absolutely a must, in my opinion, to get a professional expert who leads you through the way and make sure that you are safe and sound and properly set up right from the beginning. The decisions that you take today can or quite often will have a huge impact in your future taxation which may happen four or five, six years in the future. But if you take the right measures nowadays, it can help you a lot in the future. Problem is no one knows what the future is gonna bring, but you have to take assumptions and then try to use the best setup. So that's why tax planning, I wouldn't say usually necessary, I would say always necessary. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, if, the holding company has profits like capital gains or dividends. Those profits are within the company. And if you want to use them for private use, you need to pull them out from the holding company into your personal um, um, possession. And you can do that with salaries. Um, um, you have to pay social insurances, a half hour and so pension plan maybe on the salaries or dividends. We will look in those, in those two last, the two uh, bullet points at the end. Uh, closer when we get to the numbered example. Um, but yeah, yeah. So this is our all tasks that come along with setting up a, a, a holding company. Um, yeah, what are the pros uh, of, of setting up a holding company? So the losses can be deducted. So let's say you have five investments, two of them are flourishing, they're going through the roof, one is vague, equals out sort of, and two you have to liquidate value zero. So those two which have a value zero, you can depreciate them. Uh, so the losses are tax deductible uh, in contrast to personal ownership. Of course, if in personal ownership, if you have capital gains, you do not have to tax them. And this is why the write off, you cannot deduct that. And with the AG or with the holding company, it's different. Uh, capital increases, but also capital losses uh, um, have an impact on your tax. Uh, the corporate tax rate is lower than the individual tax rate. The lowest uh, tax rates in Zug, Luzern, Canton Suites, it's roughly 12%. Uh, in Canton of Zurich, it's 18%. And then you have other high tax cantons, 25, 30%. So you may want to, you know, make sure that you have a, a good domicile, a, a good community with, with low tax rates. Um, other advantages of a holding you know, if you invest privately, everything is, you know, yeah, on, on your personal name. Um, but if you have a company, you can separate that, um, especially if you finance your investment with third party loans. So if you have third party loans, those third party loans will be paid into the, the, the holding company. And if you know, the holding or the investments do not turn out to be profitable. The worst case would be that you have to close the holding company um, and that's it, you know, you lose your holding company, but you don't really have a downside risk. If you have them personally, you're going to be liable personally for all third party loans. So you can split the risk there. Um, <clears throat> Partners, co-investors, if you feel like, well, I feel that I'm really good at startup companies, evaluating them, investing them. I have a very good experience in that, but I do not have sufficient liquidity. Then it is probably a must to set up a holding company so you can uh, you can gain partners, co-investors. Um, 
you also can sell shares of your own holding company. So, uh, you know, you do not always have to sell the startup investments, which are in the holding company, but you could also sell the shares of your holding. Um, and that goes together with partner co-investors. It's a kind of similar. And if you have a separate legal entity, you are much more flexible in taxes and social insurances. If you are a private investor, the dividends or whatever it is, they're going to be put on your tax return, your individual tax return. Then you have the progression tax rate. That's it. But as soon as you have a separate holding, there's a huge area of additional incentives and possibilities and optimization, not only in terms of taxes, but also in terms of, you know, social insurance, retirement planning and all that, those kind of questions. But for this webinar, the main advantage is protection against a professional investor. So before you could be deemed as a professional investor, you would like to remedy this situation by setting up your whole company. And this is what the, the webinar or in this context is the most important reason for a holding company. All right. Before, well, yep. well, yep. Just a question. You know, I mean, how, you know, for someone who hasn't dealt, you know, with an old, with, with an old company, how you know how complex and and how time consuming is it you know to deal with a holding company you know in general yeah good good question i mean i myself coming from this area you know i am i am kind of leaning towards saying it's 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 not complicated um, but yeah, I think, I, I truly believe that. Um, I think at the end of the day, you have to find a good consultant, a trustworthy consultant. I always sometimes compare it going to the doctor, you know, I mean, if the doctor tells you have this and that, and you need to take this and that medicine, I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot really talk with it. You know, you just have to trust. Trust is very important. You have to, you know, take his advice for granted and 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 does what he what he recommends you to do. I don't think it's your obligation to understand all the diseases and the medication in detail. And I think it's somehow similar here. Uh, so it's not complex you need to find the right person you trust and then uh, and then he can take you know 80 90 percent can be taken care of by him um yeah okay. do you think you know there is like a, a threshold in terms of you know amount i mean in, in swiss francs you know when you should start you know thinking about you know you know putting your stuff you know in a, in a holding company and also get professional advice for that you know i mean <clears throat> No, I cannot answer, put a fixed amount to that. I think much more important is the future. Are you, you know, are you intending to make a startup investment because it's a good friend and you think it's a good, good opportunity there and I have some liquidity and that's fine, but it's kind of a closed off uh, project. Uh, you know, you do not need a consultant for that. But if you feel like, wow, this is a very interesting area, and maybe I want to do more in the future. If it turns out to be the way or not, you don't really know, but you have the intention, then I would like to advise you to go to a professional expert, even if the numbers today are very, very minimal, but they may become fairly high in four or five, six years. So then you have to go to a professional advisor right now. Um, yeah, because as I mentioned, if you take the right means now, it could help you a lot in the future in terms of taxation. Uh, sometimes I feel a bit bad for answering those questions uh, like I, I'm doing, but it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's impossible really to give numbers. Yes, no. A lot of people think that tax law is a mathematical issue. One plus one is two. That's it. Yes or no. But there's so many gray areas, so many individual situations, unfortunately. Good. Okay. There is also a question from Marcel Isler. He asks, should the tax authorities, you know, deem me as a professional investor, could I in that case still go for a holding company set up or would that be too late? Yes and no. I, for the investments that you already have done in the past, 
it may be too late. But if you intend to do more in the future, you can still set up your own holding company. And then you have sort of two, you know, uh, two vehicles. And then the, in an ideal world, those investments privately owned should be, if possible, passively managed. And the more actively managed you put into the holding. What you can also do, of course, setting up a holding and transferring all your currently privately owned investments directly at the same time as you set up the holding company, transfer it from private into the holding. That is doable. And this is something we do quite often. However, there are massive tax pitfalls. I'm saying pitfalls because those risks can be managed, but you need to have an expert there. And in those cases, we always recommend to submit a so-called tax ruling. The tax ruling is, you know, on two or three or four pages, you outline your situation, you outline what you want to do, you submit it to the tax authorities, and hopefully they are going to confirm it with their stamp, and then you're good to go, uh, because those transfers can end up sometimes a bit ugly if you do not do it rightly, uh, correctly. Um, so yeah, that would be my answer to that question. So yes, possible, but have a be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Recommendation. All right, Oliver. Um, just yeah, just proceed. Okay. And then we have many more questions okay. from the audience. Okay. Okay. I I am not gonna. If that's okay, Michelle, I'm not. I'm gonna. You know, not gonna talk too much about the slides of course i have to but maybe so we have a bit more time for questions at the end um yeah yeah so if you have a holding company the participation exemption in german it's called beteiligungsabzug maybe this is something that some participants have already heard again it's about the qualified investment so if you the, the holding company has a stake of at least 10 percent here are some additional rules or 1 million. So if you invest 1.2 million and the 1.2 million is only 6%, that's a qualified investment as well. So 10% or 1 million. And you need to have it at least for one year in the holding company. And in that case, the entire income is completely free of taxes, dividends and capital gains. Everything is completely free of taxes if you have the participation exemption within a holding company. The numbers. Um, the first three numbers we have already looked at. So let's say we have the holding company. Again, the same example with the 980,000 uh, proceeds in total. Let's say the holding company has a tax rate of 15%. You're going to pay 147, uh, 147 taxes regular. Now, if that investment has a stake of 10% or more, it's a, a, a participation exemption, zero, zero taxes. It's even better than the personal. So why let's not do that in any case? Why should I even bother holding my investment privately if I have zero taxes, if I have it in a holding? Of course, only if you have a qualified investment. Well, it's not as easy because those 980,000, they are sitting in the company. They are sitting there. Of course, they are tax-free. But at some point, you want to have personal use over those funds. So in the second step, you need to transfer those 980,000 from the company over to your personal bank account, so to speak. And that's when you have to pay taxes um, um, yeah, so why not simply do that in any case? It needs to be qualified and you need to transfer the funds from the holding to the private using a second step. How does that look like in a bit more detail? So again, we have the 980,000 gross income and then let's just assume there's 700,000 left, you know, after, after uh, you know, other taxes, maybe you have other uh, business uh, there um, and, and consulting uh, administration costs. So you basically have three ways of pulling out uh, uh, the, the, the capital from your holding. One would be salary. Salary is definitely the most expensive 
uh, way to pull out. You have regular tax rate, and then also you have social insurances to be paid. First pillar, second pillar, everything together could be easily up to 40%. However, if you do not have a third party job, this is exactly what you want to have, because only in that case you would be protected, you know, in case of illness, sickness, retirement, and so on. So you would have a pension plan coverage within your own company. If we withdraw a salary, it is the most expensive solution, but in some cases, still the best. Dividends. Dividends are certainly cheaper. There are no social insurances to be paid. Um, qualified investments, we've already talked about that. You would have a reduced tax rate. So if you set up your own comp holding company and you own 100% of the share, dividends paid out from your holding company to you personally are always reduced because you know it's a qualified investment. But there you have to dual tax uh, pro uh, problem. Uh, so the holding needs to pay, uh, you know, depending 15% uh, on the proceeds. And then if you pay it out as dividend, you have to tax it a second time. Um, but that's why it's uh, reduced in some cases. And then you have fringe benefits like home office car. Yeah, this is also a way to pull out uh, income, but those are limited, you know, maybe a few thousands or 10,000 a year that you can optimize with fringe benefits, not, not much more. So this is what you have to consider. Even if you have a qualified investment, you still need to pay taxes if you transfer the proceeds from holding to private. Yeah. Um, so Oliver, just a quick question from Manuel Broy. Um, he says like, thanks for the good explanations. Is there a need to pay a minimum salary for myself as the managing director of the holding company? Yes. Um, you are not obliged to pay out a salary. You're not obliged to pay out the salary. However, if you want to pay out a dividend, and dividend is cheaper, as you can see here, no social insurances, then the tax authorities will check in detail but that before pulling out a dividend, you have paid out a market level salary. So you are not obliged, but if you want to pay out dividends, then you have to prove that you have paid out previously a market-based salary. So yes, there are in case, depending on the individual case, yes, there's an obligation. Good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm already at the at my last uh, slide. Uh, I mean, I've said it uh, several times now, and you know, sometimes I feel a bit sorry, but uh, yeah, it's individual approach. You know, I mean, if you feel that this presentation has gives you some further insight, but you also feel like ah, it's just maybe a bit risky, and then besides the risk, I just want to make hundred percent sure that my setup is properly done call your 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 trustee or your trade hand and look at it on an individual uh, basis uh, the best setup can change over time you know quite often you start small and the individual personal approach is best but then you feel like wow i'm really good at that and i want to do it more proactively and so you know the setup uh, can change and you have to constantly reevaluate there is no right or wrong at least at the beginning at the beginning you never really know if it's right or wrong at the end quite often you do know but yeah, um, and what we see very often, you start up easy and small as a private investor and changing to a holding later. But again, just keep in mind that uh, transponierung, or transponding private assets into a holding, which is controlled by yourself, can be from tax point of view, very tricky. And the last recommendation, avoid professional investor in any case, either individual, personal, or then a holding, do not or make sure that you're not going to be deemed as professional investor. Um, yeah. So those would be my my explanations, um, and I'm happy to take more questions now. Thanks so much, Oliver, for that presentation. I think you know it was very insightful, and you know, um, looking at you know the the questions we have, it's also a topic of you know of interest to to all of to all of us. And so, um, you know, we have like many questions. So, you know, I, I mean, we have six minutes left. And so I will, you know, go through them. 
uh, like or through some of them okay yeah i mean i fully understand that maybe many participants have much much more questions than they had an hour ago uh, i i mean i understand that but but you know i just try to summarize everything uh, in, in you know 45 50 minutes but uh, yeah i'm happy please uh, Michelle, okay go. so one question was i think from marcel he asked you know if i have like you know the private you know investments and if i want to put them into that holding you know at what value Am I gonna put, you know, those investments in that holding, you know, in order to be, you know, tax option optimized? Yeah, very good question. Uh, in that case, you absolutely need to make a company valuation uh, because uh, you remember, like ten minutes or fifty minutes ago, I talked about the tax ruling. You have to submit if you set up the holding and transfer the shares, and that tax ruling would entail company valuation. It's an absolute must. Um, in our example, you know, 100,000 investment, 1 million after five years. Let's say this person, I think Marcel was it, sorry, uh, uh, wants to transfer shares in the third year. So technically, if we assume, you know, linear, the value would be 500,000. So he needs to transfer to a fair market third party value of 500,000. It needs to be a market value. For startup companies, there are very often no market values per se. So then you need to make a manual. Uh, you know, there are many company valuations, uh, possibilities, technical calculations, possibilities out there. You need to use one of them and get them ruled by the tax authorities. Yeah, so market value. Okay, and like one of the big up upsides would be that, you know, that money that the startup, you know, is valued basically that, could be, you know, regained from the holding company also, you know, tax free, right? Because it's basically the money that you have put into that holding company. Yes, but again, and 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 this is exactly, you know, the, the persons who are interested, they may Google transponierung in English. Uh, transponding, so transferring, tra transponierung. It's a very weird word. But transponierung, and that's where you can read about it. Yes, but you have to manage it correctly. You have to book, you know. So let's stick with the example: five hundred thousand worth. Uh, the nominal value is a hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand are already capital gains, which are achieved privately. So if you will bring that in, those four hundred thousand, you have to book as capital contribution reserves. And you have to do it correctly, and then you have to apply for those 400,000 towards the tax authorities for them to be tax free at the second stage. So, this is everything you have to think about, and then it's doable. But yeah, but you need the advice for that. Hopefully, that helps in the explanation. Thanks so much. And like many of our in investors, you know, ask the question, you know, what if I have, you know, invested in a company, but at the same time sit on the board and either provide services for free or, you know, for some form of compensation, may that be, you know, shares or cash? Again, I mean, if you have like two or three or even four startup investments and in a couple of them you sit on the board, you know, you have investor meetings regularly and then you give your advice and network, I don't really see an issue there regardless. I mean, that's just, you know, especially if you have a third party 100% job, uh, that's, I, uh, that, that is not sufficient. Um, but, but then again, you know, if, you know, the example that I mentioned, um, um, there is a gray area. Um, you had a similar question before, Michelle. So, uh, you know, I would like to refer to that or otherwise that participant may insist again to, to be more clear from my end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, that is definitely sufficient, you know, for the time being. And if, you know, that person has any further questions, they can reach out to you, right? And yeah, uh, I think, you know, for, for, all investors is it is very you know critical you know to understand that if they invest you know with other investors that are basically third parties you know at the same share price you know those shares you know should not be you know looked at you know as you know any form of compensation um in return for services you know 
the capital gains is a remuneration for the risk, for the business risk. And fees, that's a remuneration for work that you put into that. And in an ideal world, you should try to separate them. So for work, salary, and for the risk, you know, uh, remuneration, you get the dividends or capital increases. If you mix both of them, it could lead to some tricky tax related questions. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, last and final question here. Um, some of the, you know, participants ask, you know, how do I actually, you know, bring the startups into that company? You know, is it, you know, at, you know, the time of incorporation, let's say as, as Sacha and Lager, you know, will I do a capital increase, you know, do I, you know, um, basically get a loan um, in return for putting my companies into that holding company? I mean, like many questions, you know, here on on, on, um, on this topic, any anything, you know, that you can share? Uh, hopefully I understood the question correctly, but let's say you have a complete total startup portfolio of 600,000. Five investments, total 600,000, and you will transfer everything into your own holding company. First, you have to decide on the equity. The minimum equity is 100,000 for an uh, opt-in Gesellschaft, but you can, of course, go higher. So let's say you decide to go for 200,000 share capital. 200,000 has, it's, it's the more stable kind of financing than just 100,000. So let's go for 200,000 to, to, to stabilize the company a bit more. But then you still have 400,000 surplus and those 400,000, you can bring them in as a loan. So you bring in the 600,000 for 200,000, you're gonna get shares. And for the remaining 400,000, you could sign a seller, uh, a loan contract between you and your company and the 400,000 can be paid back tax-free obviously at the later stage. Um, that's something that we do very often. Yeah. All right. I think, you know, we, we need to stop here. Thanks so much, Oliver, once again. And, you know, to all the participants that, you know, were engaging in that webinar and were participating. Thanks so much. And please stay tuned for our next webinar. Any last words from your end, Oliver? I would like to thank everyone. Uh, thank you for the huge interest and those questions. Um, uh, yeah, again, but yeah, please feel free to 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 reach out to me anytime afterwards. Um, um, and yeah, thank you as well as SIGTIC for having me and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.